I want to share a scripture that I think I've been getting into it and out of it for a good few weeks now. At least Cheryl assures me of that. Um, <laughs> and um, so today I want to put both feet into it and hear what it is saying. And in the background, and very much in the background, because we'll come to this verse later on in a couple of weeks, but um, in, in two or three, four or five times in the Old Testament, you'll read of worshiping God in the beauty of holiness, praising God, giving thanks to God in the beauty of holiness. And what I, essentially what I'm saying is that worship isn't something that begins and ends on Sunday morning. Many times it doesn't even begin on Sunday morning. Um, much of what goes under the name of praise and worship in many churches is just religious entertainment. Yeah. It isn't worship. Uh, worship begins on Monday morning. Worship is, I say, not the kind of thing that happens on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Worship is how you do your job. Worship is what kind of a relationship you have with people. Uh, essentially, worship is knowing who he is, knowing who I am, and the dance begins. A and it opens up in our work, in our play, in our sadness, in our joys, in our troubles. That's all what worship is about. Now, I so say I'm not going to talk much about that. That's the sort of canvas. We will, in a couple of weeks, talk a lot more about that. But... Um, I want to take an Old Testament scripture and with that in mind, the what is worship, to look at these characters that show up in the story. And you know the story because I, I know I've dipped in here many times, but it, it's in Numbers 13 and I will um, read it in verse 30. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of the land, for we will surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone and spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. We even saw the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Okay. I, I think, uh, which again could... Well, it's part of the Bible school, but very quickly. Uh, do, I, th I hope you realize the Old Testament is old. <laughs> and the New Testament is new and fresh. There's a great tragedy I find in many places. There's very little preaching on the New Testament. People seem to gravitate to the Old because they, in their experience, haven't gotten beyond it. And we've got to understand what the old is doing. You find the subject matter in the Old Testament is not the subject matter of the new. It's very physical in the Old Testament, very physical. And so you have a physical temple. You have physical lambs and goats and bulls and physical bloodshed. You find the whole emphasis is on the land, the physical land, and the inheritance was you got a piece of that land to call your own. It's all very physical. And you wonder, why aren't we going beyond that? Everything we read there, the faith, is all centered on the physical. Um, and it's all centered on the if you do, big if. And so there's magnificent blessings that are spoken of in the Old Testament, but it's if, if you do. 
uh, you're allowed to come and press your nose against the glass uh, the shop where God sells his glories, but you, you've got to have enough cash of faith and repentance to get in there. Um, I could keep going, but I think you get the drift. When you come into the New Testament, what well, is new? It is so new, it says that the old is ready to be torn up and thrown away. No one ever preaches on that, but it's there in Hebrews. What, what is going on in the New Testament? We arrive finally in Jesus at what the Old Testament had been striving for and looking for, though they couldn't get beyond the physical. But now Jesus has come and taken the whole thing into its deepest spiritual meaning to the point where he sheds the last blood. There's no more. He is the new temple, and we in him become the invisible temple. He is the one who leads us into a real land for which there are no dimensions and no geography and no tour guide. You are in the land which is the very Spirit of God. So when we come to these stories in the Old Testament, we've got to see what it's saying because it's important. There are great lessons to be learned in those physical stories. But never to forget, we're not there anymore. We are in the New Testament, and therefore we're carried to where those stories were going, but in the Old Testament they never arrived. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, that's an hour of the Bible school right there. Um, and, and so we come to the great focus of the Old Testament, that, that they are delivered from Egypt. They, they see his signs and his wonders, manna in the wilderness, water out of the rock, and they come finally to Mount Sinai. And there they are given the law, but they are also introduced to themselves, that they have come out of it. They're slaves no more. They are the beloved of God. And as the beloved of God... They are the recipients of his greatest um, focus, inheritance, which is going to be the well, prototype of something that is yet to come. And that was the land. The land. They were told in um, Abraham that they're coming to receive this land. Now at Sinai, the land is just down the road. And they're, they're heading there as fast as they possibly can. And, and so um, the promises of God are now given to the final word before we go into this that God has promised ever since Abraham. Um, and in that land, they are going to be the people who play out living in the love of God. And they're going to be the people who tell the rest of the world Messiah is coming. And in that land... Messiah will come and lift us into the land that could never decay. Well, they've, they've come to the land. They've got the promise. And I, I want you to try and feel this because I am talking about us. They, they've got promises that are, well, even in the New Testament, it says that it is beyond imagination You've, you've never thought it, you've never seen it. Well, we, we get there in the New Testament, but in the Old, I'm sitting across the table from you, and I, I'm saying now here is a land, and the people there have run out of loving kindness. They, they've got to be removed because they are now a, a poisonous uh, cell in, in the whole uh, of God's creation. And, and he said, now you go into that land and every promise says, I've given it to you. I am with you. It's just walk in and take it. They, they come out of slavery, remember. And as they hear that, they realize also God made the promise. Their faith has now got to be involved in it. Their faith... In, especially in the Old Testament, was a response to the faithfulness of God. They didn't have to work the faith up. 
They didn't have to try and have faith. They had to keep their eyes in the, the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, the love of God, what truthfulness of God. And when you see the faithfulness of God, the fact he cannot lie, then that is giving to me faith. I, I participate in the very faith of God. Well, here they sit. Essentially, they're being called into a divine partnership that the God has said, I will do this. They now take this, and so the dance begins. That God says, we do, and the music is faith, and, and, and we, we walk in that. And so the first ones to put that to the test, 12, and of course it says spies, sort of, that's okay. Scouts would be a better word. Um, but who were they? Well, essentially, they were the 12 heads of the 12 families of Israel. They were the VIPs. They, they were not merely the most recognized, the most powerful of men, but also they were supposed to be anyway the people who represented Israel, who knew the promises, who knew the covenant, trusted, and they go now to look at the inheritance and bring back a report on it. They're supposed to be the people who trust in everything God has said. They were at Sinai, and as the leaders of the families of Israel, these were the ones who said, they spoke for their people and said, we'll keep the law. We're, we're given, and, you know, they were saying the amen. You realize three million people didn't answer. It, it was their representatives. These 12 men, they were right under Moses. They were the leaders of the people. They were chosen because they were seen to be men of God. So they're leaving the camp and they're going to cross the border into the land of Canaan and see what's there and bring back the reports that will excite the people to let's go take it and receive it. And they left, I mean, they had covenant promises with which they left the camp. Have you ever read them? Yeah. I know they're deep inside those books that everybody reads just before they go to sleep. It's like Leviticus. I'm sure you read that every day. And um, Exodus even up to a point. Uh, we read half of Exodus and after that we're, uh, is, you know. L listen to this one, Exodus 23. God said to them, this is what they got just as they're going to go into the land. This, this is the promise is given. Okay, now off you go. But carry this with you. Read it every day. This is what is happening. He says, God says, I will be an enemy to your enemies. I will oppose those who oppose you. In fact, I'll wipe them out. I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make all your enemies turn their backs and run for their lives. That's not a bad promise as you walk into the land. Uh, try Leviticus. I will grant peace in the land. You will lie down and no one will make you afraid. I'll remove savage beasts from the land. The sword will not pass through the country. I'll pursue your enemies. They will fall by the sword before you. Listen to this one. Five of you will chase a hundred. A hundred of you will chase 10,000 and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. I will put my dwelling place among you. I will walk among you. Be your God. You will be my people. I brought you out of Egypt, listen, so that you would be no longer slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke. I enabled you to walk with your heads held high. I'm not a slave anymore. Not bad. If you're one of the 12 and you're about to go and look at the promised land, this is what he tells you as you're walking in. Now, 
if you follow where they were, they, they went into the land at a place called Kadesh Benar. And if you know that Hebron, you might have heard of these places. Well, at Hebron was the tomb of Abraham. That means that the first thing they meet as they cross the border, coming towards Hebron, they see the tomb of Abraham. Now that should have excited them because their entire existence was based on God swearing to Abraham he would have a son, and that son would have a son, have a son, until there would be descendants like the sand of the seashore. Well, they, that was it. They were the living proof that God spoke to Abraham. So when they look at the tomb of Abraham, it should have connected them. But there were other people who lived in Hebron. Not many. Not many. They, they were three families, essentially. And they, and you can see... They, they were around nine feet tall and they were fleshed out. They didn't look idiots. They, their arms were big enough to hold their head. And three, three specific families. Later on, not at this time, but later on, Goliath would be one of those descendants. And of course, there are people in the world today like that. And especially in Africa, you find tribes. And so we're not talking about Jack and the Beanstalk. Uh, this, when it says giant, is really, that's a bad translation. The word in the Hebrew means bullies. Um, bullies. Uh, it, it means that they were tyrants. Uh, and they swaggered around and used their weight and their size to terrify people. But there were only three families. And that's not much. Of course, the three families had sons, and so there was, you know, if you're in the area, you're going to meet them on the street sooner or later. But, I, see, when they came back and reported what they'd seen to the people, they said, we saw them all over the land. The land was full of these. Oh, come on. Three families. But as they come into the land, that's, that's what mesmerizes them. They're caught, hypnotized by the sight of these creatures. The Israeli people were kind of short. I mean, not silly short, but they were kind of short. And um, so they're looking up at these creatures, and that's all they saw. It's all the three families and their kids. Uh, they exaggerated and gave the impression the land is full of giants. Well, what's happened to God and his promises? I guess the, it was in their back pocket somewhere, but at this point, not, they don't even, they, their mind has become filled with a vision of the giants, the tyrants, and, and that's all they see. They see nothing else. So they don't even mention God in their report. Not, they come back and they say, the giants, the giants, the giants. This is a land that devours its people. We're dead men if we go in there. No mention of God. They've, they've forgotten all the promises of God. He, God said he would chase these chaps. He, he said, I'll handle them. But they forgot that. The tomb of Abraham now has become just an ancient monument of something that said at the beginning of the nation, but it's, it's irrelevant today. They looked at, careful now, they looked at themselves in, and compared themselves to the physical size and the expertise that went with their size and they felt so small and I'm getting smaller by the minute, I'm getting smaller and they said, we're grasshoppers. When we look at those people we realize what we should have known before. We're nobodies. Who ever put these silly ideas in our head? We're, we're grasshoppers. And because we've seen that, and we know that's true, well, they must see it too. And they must know that's true. And they're looking at us right now as if we're grasshoppers. And they use very significantly. They said we are grasshoppers in our sight. 
Very important. They, they looked at themselves and in their sight, that the logical conclusion of looking at themselves was, we're grasshoppers. And if I see myself that way, they said, in their sight, we're grasshoppers too. We, we project. I see myself and I project it to you and I believe you see me the same. Grasshoppers. Insects. He said, I've delivered you from slavery so you'll hold your head high and walk like a man. They said, we're insects. And insects... I mean, they could have said we'd like tarantulas, but <laughs> no. grasshoppers? Oh, come on. Have you ever gone down into the field there in, in summertime? Grasshoppers. They're pathetic creatures. I mean, obviously weak. You want to slap and they're gone. They're, they're food for any other kind of animal, bird. I mean, so easily killed, they don't, you just step on them. I probably kill a hundred just walking across the pasture. And all they do is that chirping. That's the best they can do. They don't own any territory. Now, you know, we've got mountain lion down there. And that, that's her territory. We are. We're in the territory of that lion. And she comes around every time to check her territory. But grasshoppers? The pasture isn't a territory for a grasshopper. It just happens to be there. And if you want to get really detailed, I suppose it's trespassing, you know. I mean, grasshopper. And if there's a strong wind, it just blows them. They, they, they've got, they can't anchor themselves to anything. In fact, not only are they fragile, but I don't think they ever know where they're going because they... Jump, you know, and it seems they're jumping to find out where they're going. Right. They, they don't say, I'm going to go down to the river, you know. Right. No, they just jump and where they land, it, and it might be on you. And they look up as you have you seen, they look up and oh, I'm terribly sorry. I, I, I didn't yeah. mean to do that, you know. Cross up. In their own sight. Think it, think it. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to me and to you. Think it. In, in my own sight, that's the key to it. This is what I see about me. In my imagination, I'm no more than an insect. It, when, when someone says that or thinks that, that, that shows a, a deep shame when... when when I would think of myself as an insect, then I'm, I'm in deep shame. It's a self-loathing. I'm, I'm just worthless. It's disgust. It, if, if I come here as an insect, I, I want to hide. I, I don't want anybody to see me. I, I pretend. I pretend I'm a locust. I, it, it's, you know... I'll pretend I'm bigger than what I know I'm not. And that turned around that they blamed God for bringing them into this land. This was God's idea. He, he's been putting this fantasy in our head for generations. Now we're here, and what is it? He brought us here to kill us. They... In their own sight, they were grasshoppers, but then they acted and believed that in God's sight, they're worthless insects. I'm insignificant. In fact, I'm annoying. I annoy God. I'm insignificant. I'm worthless. So he'll at least acknowledge me if I keep on telling him I'm no good. He says, you know, find your place, boy. And we, no, notice what the, we are grasshoppers. Very, very definitive. And they believed that was so obvious that even their enemies saw it. And they believed their enemies, weren't they, they just despise us the same way as we despise ourselves. It's amazing to me, it really is, 
The enemy didn't say that. They didn't begin by saying the enemy, and I remember three families, but um, the enemy doesn't look at us and say we're grasshoppers. We say we're grasshoppers, and therefore they must be saying the same thing. And that, you know, it was all backwards because they said it was because of the giants. But the giants had not said it. They didn't mock the smallness of the Israelite. All this took place inside the head and imagination of those 12 men, well, 10 men. And it was all based on a lie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolute lie. Because the truth was, specifically these guys in Hebron, they were trembling when they looked at the Israelites. I mean, the Israelites were just coming into the land. They might have looked like businessmen coming up from Egypt. They might look like tourists. I mean, they didn't come in with any weapons or they're just there to see what's there. But the giants knew who they were. And when they knew who they were, it says that they trembled. The giants knew what the Lord had said to them and believed it. Okay. Forty years later, when they've been through the wilderness going nowhere and their children now have grown and their children are coming into the land. As you remember, Joshua sends two spies. Maybe we can handle two. Ten got us into trouble. Um, so he sends two. Do you remember the story? God bless your nod. Yeah. Um, it, they, they went into Jericho because they've come from another angle now. Down here is Kadesh, and now Jericho is up here. And they go in. Only king of Jericho recognizes them, and he says, get them and kill them. So they go to the house of Rahab which seems to be some kind of brothel. It was, I don't, it's not clear, but she seems to be some kind of madam or prostitute. Uh, and so they go there and she takes them and hides them on the rooftop. And when the soldiers come, she sends them off in another direction. Then she comes up to the rooftop and she says, well, it says, before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and she said to them, I know you. This is 40 years after what I just said about the giants. 40 years later, she said, I know that the Lord, Yahweh, God of Israel, has given this land to you. And I want you to know that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. See, we have heard how Yahweh dried up the waters of the Red Sea. We've heard that. You couldn't keep that a secret. You walked through the Red Sea when you came out of Egypt. We all know that. And when we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. For your God, Yahweh, your God, is God in heaven above and on the earth below. We don't stand a chance. Now that was 40 years. For 40 years... That, when did the Canaanites hear about the Red Sea? Well, it's only an hour away. They would have heard immediately. It means that when these 12 guys came into the land and the people recognized an Israelite, they immediately were terrified, lost all their courage, searched for a white flag to say, you know, and so, do you see the stupidity of this? 
They are saying, we're insects, we're nobodies. These people, they're, they're so powerful, we don't stand a chance. They'll eat us. To go into the land is like standing in the mouth of an alligator. Come on, we... we. But the people they're scared of are scared of them. Can you imagine they wiped the cold sweat from their brow when the, they looked out at the Israelites and they've turned around and they're going off into the desert? Wow, well, I don't know what's the matter with them. We can take a breath again. Yeah. See, this sense of insignificance, this sense I'm not, nothing but an insect, that was baggage. It was baggage they carried deep inside of them. I'm a slave. I always will be a slave. My father was a slave. My grandfather was a slave. My great-grandfather was a I am a slave. I'm unimportant. I'm insignificant. I'm a worthless piece of nothing. I'm a trespasser in this land. And even though God said it's mine, well, obviously, he wasn't here to see what's happening. It's irrelevant to us what he said now. Just look at these people. They couldn't receive it. When God said, I've delivered you, you're no longer a slave. Hold your head high. Walk like a man. They said, no, we're insects. You and I will never rise beyond who you know and see yourself to be. Yeah. I don't care your potential, I don't care your resources, you will never rise beyond what you perceive yourself to be. If you believe you're an insect, you will never rise above being an insect. I don't care what people say or do or pray for you or give you reason. You will never rise above what you see yourself to be. And that is, whenever I speak, it is with prayer that the eyes of your understanding will be opened, that you might see and know the hope to which you've been called. You might know the exceeding greatness of his power that raised Jesus from the dead that is now in you. You're no insect, you're bigger than the cosmos. You see, back to that canvas on which I'm painting, that's where worship takes place. I don't care what these ten men did in the tabernacle. I don't care how much they praised God and said all the religious praise words. When they, when the rubber hits the road and they see what God says and they see what's here and they are mesmerized by what was it, they're, they're swallowed up by what's here. That's their worship. Worship means to stand in awe. Well, they stood in awe of the bullies and the tyrants and forgot there was a God. And that's worship. I don't, as I say, you, you can sing how great thou art until you're blue in the face. It's how it works on Monday morning. That's where your worship is on Monday morning. When you speak of what is, you speak of where you are in terms of who he is and who he has made you. You see, when they said we're insects, I, I know many churches that would say such a humble people. They're so humble. It's not humility. That's cursing God. <laughs> it's not humility. It was the lie in their twisted mind that came out in twisted speech and behavior. I'm no good. I just don't have those gifts, you see. I'll just be content to live my little life. And Sounds so, and I know, churches will make you an elder for that, but... The truth was that they're the beloved of God. He is in them as much as the Old Testament could understand that. He is certainly with them. He was watching over them. He was caring for them. That's the truth. And David says, you desire truth in your innermost being, in the hidden part. 
let me make wisdom. It's, it's not what I look like here this morning. It's, it's not, it, it's, in, it's in the hidden part where truth is, and I know who he is, I know who I am, and I hurl that against the by, uh, tyrants. Yes. Psalm 15 says, speak truth in your heart, not here, because here might have a, a big empty gap behind it. The truth that they imagined was nothing but an empty lie. They, they, their identity, who am I? They made it up. It was based on chance happenings. So when this happened, then this is who I am. Do, do you understand that? Um, something happens to a circumstance, and in the circumstance you fail, or whatever it was. Well, then you give that as your identification. You say, I am a failure. No, it was a failure, but that doesn't make you a failure. Do, do you see what? And they, they stumble upon a situation that they hadn't been expecting, and they immediately make their reaction to it, their feelings, as their identity. And they'll carry that on. They carried it on and magnified it, exaggerated it, yeah. until the whole of three million people wasted an entire lifetime. That they judged to themselves in the light of the situations. And, and worse yet, I suppose you could say it was worse. They, they saw themselves as victims of God. Um, arose from the, this bitterness they had toward God. You know, he's brought us here to kill us. But what a statement. God brought us here to kill us. He brought us out of Egypt to kill us. This is a death trap. It's all a setup. Wow. He fed us manna. He brought water from the rock so we'd have enough strength to walk into the land and kill us. <laughs> oh, That's what he said. Right. Bitterness. And bitterness has a terrible root system. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That one person in a group who is bitter, you water your bitterness and its root system befouls the entire group. Wow, yeah. But I say again, they'd had the promises. I only read two of them to you. We could spend the whole morning going through all the promises God made. And, and they're neat promises. I mean, they're really down to earth. But they, they heard it. Their intellect heard it, but they never internalized it and made it their true identity and made it the source of their worship for such a great God of covenant who has made me who I am. It, it was they, they had the, the promises, but they never responded as to a revelation from God. It was as if Moses made it all up. But Moses couldn't make up that stuff. And they never responded to it as a revelation. Rather, they said, it's ancient history. You know, yeah, we're, we're the promised, we're the chosen people to bring Messiah into the world. All families of the earth shall be blessed by us. Yeah, well, we know that, you know. Came in with the Constitution. It's, uh, it's not, it's, it's not going to work here. When he said that, it was a different day. Now, in this day, doesn't work. We'll be suicide if we listen to it. No. They said in our sight, in their sight, but they never said in God's sight. Mm. How I look at myself is what I believe other people see me. Yeah. But then how does God see me? How does God know me? How does he announce me? It's a different picture. They believed it was true. I mean, as far as something, yes, it's true. But it's not the truth I live by. And that's a very, you know, many, many people, well, if, if I believe it's true, I must believe it. No, 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 no. You could believe something is true, but not 
enough to be the truth by which you live. It, it, it didn't, they didn't abandon themselves to it and say, this is it. There is nothing else. They, they didn't let it govern their imagination or their thinking. They rather subjected what he had said to their logic and their common sense. Well, nobody in their right mind would, would believe that, especially when you're, you're in great danger of being crushed by the big toe of an enemy. I, no, we don't, you don't accept it. You see, it's, it's very, um, very beautiful to listen to, but you don't go and stake your life on it. Um, they, they said, this is the promise, but now what I see myself to be, now that promise came through the lens of I'm a grasshopper. So therefore the promise became impossible. They saw it as a promise, but they saw it as a promise that they had to bring to pass. That is that's stupid, you know. If I make a promise to you, you don't have to do it. You follow me? You know? I, I'm going to take you to New York. That doesn't mean you've got to walk to New York to please me. No, if I said I'll take you to New York, I'll take you to New York. It, it's a promise means someone else is paying for it. Someone else thought it up to give to you because they loved you. And now they give it to you. And if I respond to that by saying, how much did you pay for that? And I really think you've overstepped the mark. This is, I can't use this. No, that, you see, it makes it also stupid. That they, they were making their identity in comparison to the physical body size and mental strength of these people. They, they, they lived at the tree of I am not, rather than at the tree of I am. And the I am himself is my I am. They were contradicting God. So little grasshopper, I've got to teach you a lesson. You don't jump where you've never been before. Get yourself into trouble, little grasshopper. Set your experience in concrete as the destination, the destiny. It's, no, that's dangerous talk. You don't do that. And if you should happen to jump too high, well, that's not of God. You've got to keep, remember, you're just a grasshopper. You're going nowhere. And it was amazing how they spoke as one voice. When they went back to the people, the 10 of them spoke with one voice. So it means when somebody in the 10 said we're grasshoppers, the others went along with it, formed an opinion of themselves through other people's fear. Yeah, yeah. Have you noticed that? Right. Right. Listen to CNN and you'll believe what they believe. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the way humans are. Mob mentality. And so we gather together and there are thousands gathered together this very morning and, and they're sharing with us that they're, they're insects. That, that we're grasshoppers. And they all believe it, not that they thought it through, but everybody is saying it, so we go along with it. And then when they came back to the people, they took their mob mind, and three million people caught it and said, yes, we're grasshoppers. And they're fiercely protective of their identity. When they came back and Caleb and Joshua said, that's not true. Well, they, they wanted to stone them. They had to go with Moses. It was a very dangerous time because once, it's amazing, you, you tell someone they're a good person, they almost rise up and punch you. I'm not a good person. I'm, not, I'm no good. No. It's... 
When we do not know our identity in Christ, if you don't know it, if you don't know it through the Holy Spirit teaching you who you are, then you're going to make it up. And you're going to make it up based on your feelings that you have, based on events that happen, and whether you're a success or a failure in your own mind. You're going to base it on the thoughts that pass through your head and say, if I have these thoughts, I must be. Yeah. And so you go. You're making up your identity. That, that passage, that is fundamental passage buried away there in the book of James, chapter 1. Prove yourself doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he's immediately forgotten what kind of person he is. That's very true. I looked in the mirror four times this morning to brush the same hair. You know, it's, it's we look in the mirror, forget who we are. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty. The law of liberty is I've taken you from Egypt so that you might hold your head high. You're a man and forget Egypt, forget slavery. That's the law of liberty. And abides by it. Not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, that man is blessed. Now the mirror paraphrase gives a much better translation Give the word your undivided attention. Do not underestimate yourself. Make the calculation. There can only be one logical conclusion. Your authentic origin is mirrored in that word. The difference between a mere spectator and a participator is that both of them hear the same voice and perceive in its message the face of their own genesis. I look in the mirror of the finished work of Christ and I see my genesis. What does that mean? It sees where I came from. It tells me who I really am. It tells me why I'm here. My genesis. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. Your first parent, Holy Trinity, your first parent, who created you for a purpose, gave you a blueprint and an intention that said it's all in Christ. That's my genesis. That's who I am. And I look in the mirror, the word of liberty, and I see that. I see it. They realize that they are looking at themselves, but for the one it seems just too good to be true. This person departs back to the old way of seeing himself and immediately forgets what manner of person he really is, never giving another thought to the one he saw there in the mirror. Is it, I, I don't want to sound like a evangelist, <laughs> but there are many people who come to our meetings, studies, retreats, and in that moment, they get it. I've, I've watched it in, in, in an audience. Like the lights turn on, almost like fire out of their eyes. They got it. And you meet them uh, three months later, forgotten it. It's a, it's a way of the human. Um, too good to be true. He forgets what manner of person he is, never giving another thought to the one he saw in that split second. He saw himself in the mirror. The other is mesmerized by what he sees. That's it. Captivated by the effect of a law that frees a person from the obligation to the old written code that restricted unto their own efforts and willpower. No distraction, no contradiction can dim the impact of what is seen in the mirror. I got it. And as we often say, when you've seen it, you can't unsee it. The law of liberty that now frees everyone to get on with the act of living the life of their original design. And every one of those, the 12 that went into the land, 
had seen themselves in the mirror. Read it, Exodus 19. There it plain is. What God thinks of them, says about them, the text that we read, they'd seen it, they'd got it. Or as soon as they walk across the border and they see something that doesn't seemingly agree with that, they lose it all. Except for two of them. And so they, they didn't see anything that they had seen in the mirror. Well, they hadn't seen. They allowed themselves to be distracted. And the result was they saw themselves inferior, very inferior. You tread on me, inferior. Rather than the largeness of the gift. And of course, I've said it, but let me now really say it. Caleb and Joshua had seen everything that the ten had seen. Twelve people saw one thing. Ten made what they saw and felt their identity. And two stood firm and said, that's according to what he has said. This is peanuts. We can do it. And that's how Jesus acted in the temptation. Satan said, Jesus' response, it is written. That is, I'm not even going to have a conversation about what you're saying. It's written, that's enough. That's what Caleb and Joshua did. So the, the approach of the ten was everything they saw was really an illusion. It was a wrong interpretation by their human senses. It was a deceptive appearance. That's right. yes. It was just an impression. They were yes. mesmerized by a fantasy. That they identified themselves by figments of their imagination. They were actually suffering a mental disorder. And that is one way of looking at sin. It's a mental disorder. It's a mind, shroud, a mind, a mind, you're where you think, shrouded in darkness, dementia, as we've said many times before, and all wrapped up in fear. Now, God did not participate in the illusion. Um, I know I said this a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's a lie, so really it's nothing. Because all lies are nothing. Right. Yeah. Oh. And we have, every so often, someone is arrested because they were so expert at telling lie that they affected thousands of people. And the lie then took on substance. It opened offices, it employed secretaries, and there were, it's on the stock market. And, and someone comes along and just punctures the lie, and the whole lot collapses because it wasn't really there. Do you understand that? Yeah, yeah. Um, what is built on a lie, the moment you really extract the lie, everything that yeah. found its food from the lie is, is no more. Yeah. Well, the Holy Trinity does not deal with lies because Trinity is love. Trinity is truth. Yeah. Trinity is light. Lies need darkness. So in that sense, he doesn't see it, but he doesn't see it as we do. We see it as substance. We see it as real. We see it as truth. God doesn't see it as truth. He doesn't see it as substance. He doesn't believe it as we believe it. And so in that sense, he doesn't see it. But he sees what we see, but he doesn't believe what we believe about it. Right. And so 
he sees the bullies and the tyrants and says, I'll make them run away. You'll never see them again. What was the next item on the agenda? You know, it, it's, I know you see them and I see them, but don't get caught into it. They were, these two of them were resting in God's word. They remembered the word spoken. That is, they were not ancient history. What God said to Abraham is present to this moment as if he just said it. What was said there at Mount Sinai a few weeks ago is present in this moment. If he says five can chase a hundred, well, that's what it means, doesn't it? It's real. It's now. This is what he was talking about. Everything is now present. Right here in the middle of all these lies and darkness that is invading us, God is present with us and he's not affected by it. He doesn't see it like we do. <laughs> and as I've already said, even the giants were not affected. They, they saw through the illusion that the Israelites were under and were ready to surrender. So, yeah, I say it again. The ten had seen them as I was in the mirror. And, but so had the two. And the two, mm. hey, when they saw themselves, they saw it. It was a revelation that latched onto their heart. And what happened, they responded to that revelation. It's what we call faith. If God be for us, who then can be against us? End of discussion. Yeah. The Lord is for me. I will not fear what man can do to me. What about Isaiah 41? Do not fear. I am with you, says the Lord. Do not anxiously look around you. There's another place he said, you're scared when a leaf blows in the wind. But he says, I'm with you. So don't anxiously look. I'm your God. Isaiah 43, I have called you by name. Yeah. And so when Caleb presented to the people what he'd seen, he doesn't even mention the giants. Mm -hmm. Isn't that fascinating? It's as if, uh, were, we there, were we in the same place? You know, his 10 people were saying, the land is full of these gigantic people. Caleb said, um, it was just people there. Um, watch your mouth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. It's amazing what we say yeah. that arises from a twisted Amen. lie. Faith is a response to revelation. Behavior follows faith it's not a struggle to get faith now if you're struggling to get faith you're way on the wrong track don't even think about faith you you are overwhelmed by the truth of who god is and what he said you're overwhelmed at the revelation the holy spirit has given you and you'll find faith rises in your heart that's why it is and, and you see, we don't change ourselves or circumstances by, by trying to put a faith formula inside of us by constant repetition. No. I have faith. I have faith. I have faith. I have. No, you don't. You're a robot. That's, that's not a... F you know? The Lord is with me, I hope. <laughs> no. You've seen it. You don't... It just pours out of you. That, that's worship, you see. Worship is when the chips are down, when the rubber hits the road, and you find yourself speaking out of your identity. Mm -hmm. And that, that's worship. Yes. Amen. And we're not our feelings, you see. We have many feelings. People are condemned by that. We have many feelings. Well, you're not your feelings. Why didn't I say this two weeks ago? I... I... I feel so there's an i yeah. your true self who is feeling mm -hmm. you say it your your feelings are not you Amen. your feelings is something that you have 
I am feeling. So I'm reporting to you that certain responses are going through my flesh. And I know, and I hope you know, and we all know, that that's not me. I'm just reporting that it's passing through my flesh. But it has no more to do with me than a dead corpse. It's a feeling. We look beyond our feelings to see yeah. how Father sees us. Yeah. So, kill the grasshopper. Or should I say, the grasshopper was killed Amen. in the resurrection Amen. of Jesus. Yes. Amen. Well, I could take off from that. Because Jesus actually became us in our grasshopper mind. It's reported in Psalm 22, I am a worm and no man. He came right down into our lie, our lie mind. He got inside it. He became us. And then he took that us to death in him. And when he rose from the dead, there were no worms and no grasshoppers. But one who held his head high and walked like he is, the Son of Man, Son of God. And I'm in him, and you're in him, and I ain't no grasshopper. So, amen. 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 Father, thank you. Thank you that we report this morning mm -hmm. with great joy that we are the sons and the daughters of God. Yes. That we hold our heads high because that's where they belong. And we crush the enemy under our feet. Yes. And we watch as every enemy remembers that in Christ Jesus they were defeated. And they flee before us. We give you thanks for such a salvation. And declaring together that is the way it is. Amen. And amen.